Welcome, welcome. Thank you guys so much for joining Elevate the Talk with me and your uh, your other host, Marco Da Silva. <laughs> What's up, guys? How are you? <laughs> oh, man. How are you, Marco? I'm very good, Josh. Uh, you up in Seattle. I'm in L.A. Uh, this is the beauty that now we can all do this, right? Yeah. We can just all sit together and, and, and chit-chat. And um, we are so, so, so excited about Episode 3 because... Um, Episode three has someone waiting in a guest room that is, um, I want to say, uh, legendary because this person um, been around the block. Let me tell you that. <laughs> been around the block. She's, um, you know, and she's not Jenny from the block, but she's been around the block. Yes. So, you know, um, she's from uh, Cleveland, Ohio, um, started DJing in 82. Which, if we make the math, that's almost four decades, guys. Four decades. Wow. Uh, moved to New York, 87. Worked at a record store. And when you work at a record store, why not opening your own record store? So this is so exciting. Y'all know um, we're going to have a lot to talk about, about the industry, with the industry, and with no further ado. So goddamn excited. We have in the waiting room, Susan Morabito. Yes. So excited. Here we go. And there she is. Yes. Boom. Yes. Welcome, Susan. Susan. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> oh my God. So 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 uh, extremely cool to have you. Yes. Well, thanks for having me. Yes. Thank you so you. much to for agreeing to do this, taking your time. There's always choices. Um, but you immediately said yes because you saw the bigger picture we hope and um it's just going to be a fun fun conversation and uh kudos and i want to also welcome your pink glasses yes i love the pink glasses (laughs) (laughs) they're amazing susan how are you i'm good i'm good nice are you in um where are you based right now where am i based right now yeah like where in new york Oh, you, you're you in, you're still in New York, yeah? I'm still in New York, yeah. I live in a neighborhood called Alphabet City, which is the very far east end of Manhattan. Uh, oh, nice. Kind of east village, but even further east. Yeah. So when you moved to New York back in 87, you never left? You stayed? I never that left. Was your, well, actually, that was your... Well, actually, I took five years off. I went to Provincetown, Massachusetts, and then I came back to New York. So I took a little break from the city. Hmm. It's healthy. You got to, I mean, from my friends that live in the city, and uh, you got to take a little break off and on. It it's, can get very overwhelming, right? Exactly. Hmm. Yeah. And so, nice. what, like, how long, how long have you been DJing in New York? Um since 1987 since i moved here i mean it was a struggle in the beginning but i after i moved here in about two weeks i got a job at a record store called vinyl mania records Mm -hmm. and that's Mm -hmm. where everybody shopped you know they had a location on the upper west side and they had a location in the west village and everybody shopped there you know back then there were limited record stores and obviously you didn't have online and Manny Lehman was the counter person. Oh, wow. Manny. No way. Yeah, yeah. So wow. a lot of, I know. So Manny and I go way back. And mm-hmm. basically his job was, you know, he was maybe about two feet up and there were turntables behind the counter. And you would just have, you know, depending on the day, let's say there was a Friday you would have maybe 30, 40 people in the store and he would just start pulling things off the wall or the customers would start pulling stuff and you'd create a pile or piles and he would go from pile to pile playing the music and then it was kind of a free fall. I'll take one of those, oh, wow. no, I'll pass, whatever. So, you know, and then he would just hand out the records to who wanted, who wanted what they were hearing you purchase them and be on your way. So that That's was so a awesome. really cool job. So by now, working at Vinyl Mania, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Well, because I worked at Vinyl Mania, I had the opportunity to meet so many people in the industry. And actually, it was Manny who 
set up my first job, which was out on Fire Island in the Ice Palace. Mm -hmm. He knew somebody mm -hmm. there. He mentioned me. So that had to have been the summer of 87 because I moved to New York in February. Mm. That is so, so wild. Right. Yeah. So, you know, and it took time to play at the places that back then were more relevant. So maybe yeah. by 1989, I played at the Pavilion. Yeah. Uh, which well, is okay. really, you know, the premier spot to play on Fire Island, which is in the Because park. I also imagine, you know, I, I, I imagine it to be so, the hustle, so different and so more intense because obviously there was no com internet, period. Yeah. So uh, there was, there, you know, there was okay. nothing to really rely on. What do you mean rely on? As well, far spread as what? spread of words, spread of word, and postings, and flyers, and just how things, how we are so educated now, what's going on in the world. I f would or imagine you... that back in the days, it was so hard to even get a start and to even get to be or known. even to find music. I mean, right? Well, I mean, well, it really wasn't because you had Vinyl Mania, which was the first 12 inch store in New York. Now, I can't remember. Which became when a community. Vinyl opened. Mm. And then, you know, after that, there were more. But, you know, the thing is, is it, it's interesting that you just said all that, you know, because you came from a day where it was your exposure was through the internet. Our exposure was going to clubs. Mm -hmm. hanging yeah. out at the clubs that you wanted to work at, getting to know the people who went to the clubs, because even though New York is an incredibly big city, it's really part of the same family. So back then you had the same. So if you had, let's say, a black party or a white party, there might be 4,000 people there. On a regular Saturday night, there were 2,000 people there. And n not to say they were stale faces, but... If you went to the Saint, you went to the Saint almost every Saturday. You hung out in the record stores. What was kind of cool, though, is by doing all that, I got to know people. I got to know the club owners or the promoters of these events, different people um, who might have heard me play at a house party because it started. I started off playing very infrequently. Might have They started talking me up. Mm -hmm. So it was really people who heard me that sold me. Mm -hmm. I didn't really wow. have to sell myself except for networking. Right. So. And like. Nobody knew and, what we looked like either. That was. <laughs> <thing>. Yes. <laughs> you know, because it was you, not about that. It was well, not about it, that. It wasn't about that. But there also back then there weren't gay rags really. You know, in New York, you had uh, had HX and Next, and that didn't come around until maybe the early 90s. So in the late 80s, you know, the mid 80s, you just didn't have, you know, nobody knew what we looked like unless you knew us. Right. Or you've which, seen them in, uh, perform or whatnot. Well, even then, it was hard to know what the DJ looked like because mm. it wasn't like there it's were lights on us. Oh, yeah. You know, like some booths were maybe 10 feet higher than the crowd, which I, of course, love because you get a whole full view of the crowd. Mm -hmm. Then you get the balcony view, depending on the club. And we were like a shadow. And so you when know, did when, kinda... do, when do you think that that changed? When did when did it become about the DJ? Well, it was about the DJ then, but it was about listening to the DJ, not looking at the DJ. It was exactly. more I, about I, I, the DJ back applause. then, yeah. applause. I think, <laughs> than it is now. It was more I find about it, music and that focus. 100%. I find it so unbelievably awkward uh, to be at the desks or when I go out on a dance floor and DJs are being treated as, I don't know, um, rock stars or something to look at. It's just, I just don't understand. It's a concert. Going to a club these days, it's like a concert. Everyone is just staring at the DJ, which is so disconnected from the music because it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I'm not doing anything special, but I, 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 I miss agree. the days. I miss the days where people were paying attention to one another, you know, and not mm, staring at LED screens, I guess, you know. <laughs> and I want to go back to what you said that 
you know, these days everything is is the internet. And back in the days, you would go to the club where you want to play. And and I 100% agree with that. I just unfortunately don't think that that concept works anymore because you go to the club and the people that you want your attention, they just don't pay attention. They, I think the the networking aspect has become such a burden to people and people um i feel like have a problem with the idea oh he wants something well and i don't know i that's just i feel back in the days it was probably a lot different the approach you know but it, it wasn't like i went to a club and i i was hunting down the owner or the promoter <laughs> You know what I mean? These are clubs I would mm -hmm. go to over and over and over again. So it was one of those situations where somebody might have introduced me to a club owner. Oh, and I heard her play, mm -hmm. you know, and like I said before, the crowd did my selling for me much yeah. more than I did. I showed up. I was sociable. I was gracious. I had to obviously well i shouldn't say obviously but i think i had talent people like to hear obviously me. so people really did all that for me and i don't mean to say for me like i was being lazy but now you know you're right you know the marketing is such a big part of facebook and putting yourself out there on that level um i guess club promoters do notice you obviously they do notice you on facebook how you market yourself what you look like if you yeah. have podcasts out how many people like your stuff i guess mm -hmm. yeah you know that i i would i would assume so <laughs> it's a difficult but the question is what is the what is the priority for them no, I, I then, think that depends. Is it on about the, the music, or is it about the exactly? Is it about the music, or is it about the uh, the the status? Because the status fills the club, and it's it's something that promoters need these days. Of obviously, we need the numbers in the club for the party to be a party. You right, know? but I also think you can have both. I think you can have mm -hmm. status. One hundred percent. I mean, one hundred percent. You need to have great both. DJ you have status but you have mm -hmm. to build up to have that status mm -hmm. Amen. so you know does a promoter there are promoters no doubt who hire people based on looks and their looks give them status mm -hmm. i'm not saying that they don't have talent you know it, it's it, because there's that is so common you know yeah. and, and that's all subjective anyway but mm -hmm. you know People hire DJs for a lot of different reasons. I don't think there's one reason. Mm -hmm. You know, now, somebody but, might hire you for one reason, and that same club owner slash promoter might hire me, but for a completely different reason. 100%. 100%. So what was your sound like when you started to DJ? Like, I'm sure there was an evolution of so many sounds and genres you went through, but back in 82 slash 87, when you get to New York, what was the sound like? Especially your sound. I, I started playing in 82. I moved to New York in 87. So what mm -hmm. my sound was like in 82 versus how I played New York was very different. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the, the thing about New York is we played really long hours, mm -hmm. 10, 12 you know, a 10 hour evening was very common. So you had a journey, you had an arc to the evening and you had a slow build, you know, then kind of like a tease, then you had the climax and the peak, and then we would bring it back down. So what they uh, call- So basically a journey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, basically a journey. Bring, I mean, you could still do a journey like this. Sure. You know, with a couple dips, but we did a full journey. Well, is know? it a journey I mean, or is I it just a, pla a, a, a plain pasta dish with no, with no spice? You know, a journey for me is going through different genres and exploring and taking people uh, to places they didn't thought they would like to go. This is true. 
you know, and uh, but it takes an audience to trust, and and it takes obviously the conductor slash the DJ to know what he's doing in that moment because it could right. also could go wrong, you know. But yeah, I miss those days. I miss the I miss. I miss the journeys and the essence of it. And we talked about it last week with Curtis and we dropped it a little bit. The, um, you know, junior would do, would play a 15 minute loop and make it a journey out of it, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was just a 15 minute loop, but it was amazing because it was mesmerizing and it was, and our attention span was a lot longer than it is today. So very exciting. Probably was longer our attention span. Sure, I mm -hmm. mean that's that's something I hear a lot. The attention spans. Yeah, and I so think which, so. I mean, yeah, yeah, and so I want to kind of continue this this thread about the, the 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 difference between playing elsewhere and playing in New York. People mm -hmm. don't understand that it takes a certain type of DJ to win over people in New York when you're playing. <laughs> There's a different, um, it's just a different class, I would say, of DJ required to play a party in New York. <laughs> I'm just what saying. What I say? It's New York. It's, it's New York, the right? Universe. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think I've, I, I've, I've heard DJs like Paulo tell me, you know, when you've played in New York, you know you've made it because it's, it's like, it's kind of like the, the go to for the, the, the up, it's just true. Yeah, I would agree with you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, like the song says, if you make it here, you make it every. You can make it anywhere. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I, I think that still holds true today, yes. even though New York does not have the best clubs anymore. We did mm -hmm. back in the 80s and 90s. We had the greatest clubs almost in the world, but hands down in the country. Mm-hmm. And, we don't and, have those great clubs anymore. We have some good ones, but they're not as great as they used to be. Tell me about it. I cried when Roseland Ballroom closed. Uh, that was like for oh, me. Yeah. Uh, stop it. Yeah. Stop it. Well, that actually, was... uh, going on on that the, on that, like we actually asked. Um, I believe it was was it Curtis and, and David Michael. We asked them, uh, you know, of the clubs that have closed. Okay, clubs past of New York City. What would have been the, the the your favorite club of all time? The and Saint. you and yeah, you've played at all of them. So, so. <laughs> well, I never played at the Saint. Oh, really? I, I played Saint at large parties. Okay. And that's when they were moving around, and then they ended up. Roseland was their permanent home, maybe mm -hmm. the last ten years. Yeah. But that club started off in 1980 and actually closed its doors in 1989. Mm -hmm. And that was the ultimate club. We will never, ever, ever see anything like that again. Um, my career, I was, you know, I just didn't have the status, the cachet, the mm -hmm. experience, the following to play the saint. So when they closed, you know, that was a, a shattered dream for me. Yeah. However, I carried on that tradition when I started doing their parties as, you know, I developed more of a name for myself. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. See, I didn't even know that this the same black parties come from the club scene. See, it, it, I didn't even know that. That's amazing. That's interesting. Yeah, no, that's a good piece of history. As a matter of fact, yeah. if you go to the Saint Saint at Large website, you'll see a virtual. They did a virtual Saint, and oh, it wow. was in a dome, like a Hayden Planetarium. Wow. So you know, I don't want to go on and on and bore you guys by the. No, this is it. far <laughs> beyond from boring. Well, this is what, here's the this thing, is... though. It really, the best way to explore it is to just look for photos online because yeah. I'm not going to do it justice. I mean, their opening invite was a blueprint of the club. Wow. That is just so and cool. So they were ahead of their times. They were ahead of their times. And Creatively. The, the I mean, the space yeah. that they took over was the old Fillmore East where Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, and, you know, people of that caliber used to perform in concert so mm -hmm. it was an old theater just like the palladium was an old theater 
Uh, who were the residents at the Saint back in the uh, days? Like, who were like the big, but the big players up there, the big ballers? The, the <laughs> residents were Robbie Leslie, Michael Fearman, mm -hmm. Terry Sherman, Warren Gluck, Chuck Parsons. Wow. Oh, geez. I know. Do, do you guys know? I know Robbie Just, Leslie. I... <laughs> And that's three no names sounds familiar, but I'm the puppy. I'm you know, the DJ just, puppy. So, <laughs> yeah. So uh, Sharon White played there. She was actually the first woman to play there. Um, Talking actually, about first woman, Susan, first woman. You were the first woman to play, though, at the Saint on Large Black Party. Is that correct? Black Party. Sharon was Black the first Party. woman to play the Saint which she actually played the original saint. And honestly, if it wasn't for Sharon, I never would have thought I could have done it because mm, wow. the saint was an all male club and it was membership only. Wow. So you could go only if a member sponsored you Oh shit. or you had a membership. If you were a woman, you had to have a sponsor. So the first that is wild. That is so wild. It was, a, it was, you know, and there were rules, no drinking on the dance floor, no smoking on the dance floor. It was great. <laughs> I'm telling oh, you, wow. I wish that when was still the When did the same case. close? When did it close? Uh, I think it closed in, I want to say 87, no, 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 89. 89, oh, so you had two years of... But you started to go there earlier, right? Before you went to New York? I started or... to go there... In 1982, I would drive up to New York for a weekend with friends. We'd get in the car. We'd come up for the white party or the black party or the oh land God. to make believe party. And, um, yeah, well, we'd that stay is the night and then drive back. <laughs> That, that is simply this, amazing. This all resonates for me a little bit. Like, obviously, I, I never had that experience, but I had a similar experience with clubs in L.A. when I had just moved to L.A. And you're talking about, you know, when you first – when you want to play, when you're a DJ, a new DJ especially, and you want to play at a club, what's the best way to make it in there? Well, you go to the club and you make those – those connections with the bar staff, with the security, with the with the go-go boys, with the DJs, with the promoters, and you get to know them and you make it known that you are at their party supporting their party. Right. Right. You become a part of that community, yes. which is important. Absolutely. You know, it's also that's a passion too, you know, for right. me to me to want to go to a club every freaking Saturday when I wasn't working and driving from Cleveland, you know, it, it's, it's, I was very passionate about my craft. Well, I still am, but also wanting to make it in New York. A hundred percent. Yeah. Wow. This is, it's so beyond cool. So, and now almost 40 years later, you are as relevant as, and this baffles my mind because there's, you know, there's a lot of DJs uh, that had their peak in the 90s and then they just, for whatever reason, give up or it didn't work out or the sound didn't develop. But you are still a relevant name dropping at every other party with all the big promoters, with all mm -hmm. the big events from Master B to you name it. What makes, why do you think that is? Why do you think you, 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 you still have that special. Sauce. Tell us your secrets. <laughs> Tell us your secrets, no, honey. No, no, it's, it's I'm gonna, not, I'm, it's... I'm gonna go and get those pink, pink glasses. If that's it. No, 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 no. It's not that that I, I feel I have any secret. I, I, part of me is a little embarrassed because, well, part of it I think is because I'm when I'm on, I'm really on. Yep, we can See tell on your stream. I was by saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen your streams. I've seen your streams on Twitch when you're like dancing around in your living room or where your studio or wherever you're streaming from. And I have to say, like, I'm just like, I'm with her. I understand like where she is right now in the music and just like loving it. And yeah. Well, thank thank yeah. you, Josh. I, yeah. Thank you. That's really sweet. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think, you know, part of it is, is I, I, 
do a journey well. Mm -hmm. I also feel I have very good taste in music. And I I think that also translates, you know, people want quality and um, with everything, Mm -hmm. you know. I agree. uh, I agree. People want quality and they want something different. um, And I feel you, from what I hear, um, I have have yet to hear you play live in a club. We never had the luxury or I never had the luxury to share the decks with you. Um, but what I hear from people is that you are just different. It, there's just this different essence. And to me, it's clear that it's just knowledge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's I, I not, think... it's knowledge. It's different is, is basically really just be knowledge and take and, and knowing and taking essence from different decades maybe. And just, um, yeah, I just, I just am so I can't wait for the day to just hear what you how do you how do you treat a night honestly Well thank you, thank you Marco that's no, seriously. really sweet that's very very sweet um I I I think you know uh, there's a lot to be said for experience and mm-hmm. and that's with everything you know yeah. that runs across yeah. the board with no matter what you do but you have to have the passion behind that experience with no matter what you do. So um, I also rebranded in 2013. I dropped Susan and I just did Morbido. Mm-hmm. And I think that was also very helpful, mm-hmm. you know. Now, that's, um, just, that's a question. When the intro was playing, um, that's something that had in my mind. I was like, I wonder why she's not going for Susan Morbido and it's just Morbido, a let's say a project name. You became a project. I want to call it now, uh, like that. But what makes you do that? Like, what was the intention behind it? Because it's very interesting for me. Because some people do it, some people don't. Some people just go by their first name, and it works for them. Like, it's interesting. What was your um, initiation? To the drop reason Susan? why I did it was to. Because I was around so long, the younger generation started to have preconceived notions about me. Mm-hmm. So you heard the name Susan Morbido. Oh, yeah, she played way back when. She plays, you know. So by dropping the Susan, it kind of said, this is something new. It's like a new, mm-hmm. fresh scent. I love this. I'm still that person and I still come with that experience, but it's putting something out there to say, this is new. Give me a chance. Pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. I'm as relevant as I ever was. So it was really putting a visual to what I was doing musically. I remember that. I remember mm-hmm. back in 2013 when when you did that, and I believe it was Labor Day in LA uh, when you and I were on the same bill. And That's I remember right. it was at Circus Disco. Do you remember that? I do. Yeah, I do. And and I just remember. I think I either opened up for you or I played earlier in the night, maybe like two DJs in or before. Like and, you did, yeah. And I was just I stayed because I remember thinking to myself and Ray Ray Diaz was with me and he's like you know you you definitely need to stay for this. And I just remember being like in awe. You had you had your tractor open, you had your decks playing, you had four tracks going at once and this was when I was a new DJ. This was what, what 8 years and 7 7 8 years ago and I was just like my mouth was a, was just a jar like I was just like, how is she doing this? And, you know, it's, it's, you could tell that the experience and, you know, just the, 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 the knowledge of how to work a room that large, because Circus Disco, if anybody remembers it, it was a, yeah, Felicia Villani knows. She was like, yeah, it was a momentum. And I was like, yeah, that's right. Um, and you, if anybody has played in Circus Disco, this is a, a gigantic club. It was echoey as all get out. And you just could not really play these really high, high pitched, you know, really with a lot of highs. You had to play really hard drums, bass. 
and you just did it so well. I mean, and that doesn't come from a, a new DJ very easily. You've got to know the room. You've got to know how to play a big room like that. Tell me about that. Uh, which part do I? Yeah, well, tell, well you tell me, tell, <laughs> tell me about, tell me about the first couple of gigs after you did the 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 rebranding. Well. Mm, I'm not quite sure where you're going with this. I'm sorry. When when you when you did the rebranding back in 2013, what was what were people's what was people's initial perception of it? Did they remember Susan Morbido and just thought it was a fresh look, or did you think that a lot of people just thought of you as a new DJ almost? I think some people thought of me as a new DJ. Mm -hmm. What? Thanks for clarifying yeah, that. Yeah, sure. I, I think anybody who knew the name Susan Morbido, it was, oh my God, she's been around forever. So for those people, all of a sudden Morbido comes out, big change. We're, to, we're, to, we're mixing it up. Mm -hmm. And I did change my sound quite a bit. Hmm. For the younger generation who didn't remember Susan Morbido, and that could range in any ages, I suppose, depending on when you came out, it's really kind of cute because when they address me, they call me Morbido. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which kind of throws me. A yeah, little bit. yeah, yeah. You know, because it's not like I would ever introduce myself as Morbido. I'm mm -hmm. Susan. Yeah. You know, Morbido is just right. the brand. Mm -hmm. But it's just cute because that's how they know me. And that's how they feel I want to be addressed. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if that <laughs> answers your question. It but. does. I mean, like that. It's just it, it was a cool period of time. I think for for those of us who hadn't really known you, um, pro, you know, in the years past, and then got to know you as Morbido. I feel like that's a whole different thing. Like your sound, it sounds like evolved and changed right. for for this new that, brand. That's right. And yeah. I needed to put a brand name to that that sound yes i needed to also make it visual so mm -hmm. um it worked it worked sure it as was, hell did <laughs> you know. and um how does morbido sound today if you were to explain uh a, a, a new little chicken in the scene and he <laughs> asks you and that little chicken asks you what do you play what's your sound like mm -hmm. how would you describe yourself in 2021 well, it depends on the party. Mm -hmm. Pre or post pandemic? So, <laughs> pardon me? Pre or post pandemic? <laughs> well, that's true too. Yeah. But, but you know, it, it doesn't depend on the party. Is it an afternoon mm -hmm. party? Is it a Saturday night party? Sure. Is it after hours? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to play different for all those parties. But I will say that I really love the whole tech house thing. And mm. the interesting thing about Tech House and even techno is it can be very pretty. It can be very uplifting. Mm -hmm. The melodic Beautiful. stuff. You know, if, yeah. you know, if you know music, you know, you do know that some of the stuff uh, that has more energy or a moderate energy, whatever, it, it mm -hmm. is considered tech house. But some of it is absolutely beautiful. Some of it's dark and heavy. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, so I definitely like a tech house sound. I also like, I'm noticing disco is coming back in very, with very, some the, tech the house. 2000, yeah, the 2000 house tracks are all being resampled at the moment. Mm -hmm. And everything that is like late, late 90s and early 2000s is so coming back. And don't we say like every 20 years, it's like, we're getting the style back. <laughs> yeah, but I see that a lot. Like, Tool Room Records are releasing so much house music. Like, literally, it brings me back to the good old days. And some of them are even... It's not even that they put, like, the new 2021 drums on it. It just has the essence from back in the days and is, is beautiful. I just recently had a set on Twitch. I did, like, a classic house one. And it was interesting because... In two hours, I played tracks that were released in 93 and tracks that were released in 2020, mm -hmm. and you couldn't hear a single difference. Yeah. They it's all sounded the same essence and vibe, and it's beautiful. And it's beautiful it that that is happening again because it's going to lift up the atmosphere in the clubs again. Clubs got very dark 
mm. because the music got very dark and okay. very um the, the 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 vocals had no meaning or no soul or no mm, essence or whatever it is so everything was very dark and i feel with right. this little push that we're getting now with the vocals it, it's going to lighten up um uh, the room again the way we used to you know Right, right. You, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that about Toolbox because I was music shopping the other day and I heard I bought a bunch of tracks that have just gorgeous piano in it. Yeah. House music with this lovely piano and, and uh, vocals and it's sweet. Yeah. I mean, how many times has String of Live been re <laughs> re, re, re remixed and re, re reconstructed? <laughs> but it still works right it still works it just doesn't matter there's there's certain vocals and certain samples that will always just work totally no yeah, matter that's who right. touches a, you a know a song will last forever through generation For, after generation ever after ever generation. ever ever <laughs> yeah. all right so i want to open it up to our audience here we've got a uh, quite a few people still watching and uh, if anybody has a question for uh, Morabito, better known as Susan Morabito. If you want to uh, send us those comments and we will uh, air them here. And uh, if uh, Susan would like to answer them, she's more than welcome to. Absolutely. Guys, so, oh, wait, can we, you know what? I am so embarrassed. Wow. I drank all my water. Yeah. I'm just going to go for it. We pee have break. a little pee I'm break, so a little pee break. <laughs> sitting here. Yeah, go right ahead. <laughs> go yeah. right ahead. Yeah. So I mean, this, this is amazing. Is, I love this. And honestly, if anybody's not heard Susan Morbido, I mean, this is really the opportunity to 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 hear her live is on her Twitch. I believe that she has. Uh, okay, I, I, I'm so sorry about that's that. That's all right. You're good. That's we were all just, right. We're just promoting you. Yeah, we were letting people know. Like, when is your when is your next uh, Twitch uh, live stream so that they can hear um, you? Next Sunday. February 14th, right? February Valentine's? 14th. Valentine's. Called, yeah, Valentine's, but I'm, I'm calling it White Party. Nice. And, oops, okay. sorry. And um, that's because there used to be an ongoing White Party in New York this weekend for oh. decades. Yeah. Oh, wow. So it's kind of in lieu of that, even the, well, whatever yeah mm -hmm. um but um yeah it's so it's from i'm sorry i'm like <laughs> the water it's, all good, right? yes, <laughs> all good. it's almost like i can't chew gum and walk at the same time i feel you girl yet, trust DJ, me you're doing how many things at the same time right <laughs> so anyway so it's from six to um 10 o'clock you know might go later if people are still in into it and that's eastern time right Huh? That's Eastern. That, yeah, that's yeah, okay. Coast. Yeah, cool. that's, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just automatically think everybody is thinking about East Coast. <laughs> right. <laughs> Everything <laughs> runs around New York. Well, so what is your um? What is your um? What does your setup look like when you when you play live in the clubs back? Well, back in the days. I mean, pre uh, 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 pre pandemic, but also now when you do the Twitch or at home, what is your uh, what is your setup? Are you a tractor girl? Are you a record box? Are you old school on the you, vinyls? You, you go vinyl, yeah, no, you know. But I regret. <laughs> well, no, you know why I said that. I said it's that because. I was I sold my record collection. I digitized a lot of the stuff that I wanted, wow. actually almost all of it, and it took like ten years to do. And then when I moved back to New York, I was not going to bring my records with me. I was not going to have a room filled with records. You know, come in, in New York City apartments are small. It's so true, yeah. and that's why I said that. However, I kind of regret selling them all. Mm. I almost miss now because I'm seeing DJs do it, and it's yeah. Kind of I was just about go, to ask, Ooh, like you know, it would be kind yeah. of fun to do it again. So, but what I have here is one of those Pioneer DJ XDJ. What is it? XZ. Uh, XZ. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, you know, everybody's familiar with those with the thingies, the the CDJs. Yes. You know, after I left vinyl, obviously I went to CD, and then from CD, I did go to Tractor. And the reason why I went to Tractor was 
on vinyl, you have all your music in front of you. Mm -hmm. It's there, and you just leaf through it all. And I had everything labeled, artist, title, mm -hmm. uh, BPM. And so I would organize them in BPM. When I went on CD, I put one track on each CD and I had the exact same labels, you know, labeled just like my vinyl. They would be in one of those carry around cases and mm -hmm. same thing. I could just go through them all and see everything. Mm -hmm. I didn't like the fact that the CDJs have this tiny yeah. little, drives me crazy. Yeah, I, wanna see, I agree. I, I, you know, I got to keep shuffling and try. Yeah, I just want to see agree. at least and 30 tracks. When me, it was the same. It was the same issue. So and still till today, I use my iTunes as my library because I have all my comments for the tracks and all the all my little notes that I need. And I see it on a big page, so I see 40 tracks at the same time, and I don't have to scroll through a thousand things. So as much as it looks like I'm – people are sometimes confused when they come and see me live because I have an iTunes on. They'll be like, are you playing on iTunes? I was like, girl, no. Who plays on <laughs> iTunes? I mean, seriously. But that's just my way back in the days, and it kind of like – I stick with it for whatever reasons. And I, I, I was on Tractor for a hot minute. I'm just scared about the unreliability of it. It happened to right. me two, three times. And that just in the club, in the heat of the moment, when we don't have the luxury of having technicians with us and tech guys where right. they can take right. care of it while you keep playing. Um, I went over to back to CDJs. Now I have a controller just as you and Joshua has one too. So the record box is like the equivalent to a tractor, I guess, these right. days. Although I like tractor a lot better than record box. Right, yeah. right. It's more intuitive. It's smarter. Yeah. Uh, it's visually. Yeah. The, the interface is laid out so much better. When I bought this, though, uh, what I'm go I'm doing now is is I'm actually playing off a thumb drive, because I okay. want to do both. I want to have the option of doing both. Uh, I I'm tired of carrying around my computer and a five pound uh, computer stand and also having that visual in front of me you know they can't really see me and I'm like this to see them mm -hmm. so yeah, I've had sense. to devise a way what works for me on my thumb drive and what I might do when we start playing in the clubs again is um, maybe get an iPad so I have a bigger visual yeah if yeah, I, I, I think of, of, I think I remember know, my... Paolo doing that for a minute with an iPad. I think I don't I, I I'm not at sure. A, but... At the club or, or during his live stream? I think at the club, but maybe I'm just putting up a rumor that is so not true. So I'm taking all this back. But I yeah, remember I some DJ that was not playing with an iPad, but had an iPad to support to look at something. I thought it was Paula, but maybe it wasn't. Maybe it's I'm just trying me. to think of the app or what program that would be, because um, it might have been record box has like a mobile thing where you can actually see what your decks are playing. Maybe, and, I, and I think that yeah. that does exist, but I don't remember Paula doing that. He can't even get his. Mm. Yeah. As Paulo. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> Paulo, if you're watching, I love you. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> delete it. Um, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> He's playing at 6 p.m., y'all. So, if you want to watch Paulo and that see, is amazing. And, and see him come for me, <laughs> Susan, uh, you've um, really quick to your story again. You've um, you then open up a record store yourself, yes. So, you did that. Did you also produce your own parties? I believe you did. I did. You did your homework. Did you read my Girl. You must have read my bio because Girl, we ain't beeping we, around here. Yes, we read yeah, everything. No, you did your homework. <laughs> yeah, um, I did I did. I did uh, after the Saint at Large Black Party, I did Equinox every year. So mm -hmm. it was like a post black party. I did gay pride after hours. And then oh, nice. I did occasional Sunday teas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe combined about 40, 50 parties over the years. Something I like wish that. the Sunday teas, that's the one thing I wish would come back so badly. Mm. The Sunday teas were just, I wish these people today would understand how fun tea dances were back in the days. 
where yeah, you would just they... go at 5 p.m. and at 11 at 11 p.m. you would be back home, but you had the best time. So they don't have the uh, sun, Sunday teas. No. In not LA? not the not the traditional ones that you know no. were back in the day. No, these are yeah. these are like you know Sunday tea, uh, you know Sunday sex parties. Yeah, it, it's not not the same thing. <laughs> really? So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think the last Sunday party that I remember being the essence of that, and it's not even the same hours, was Hero in New York. I feel that was the last Sunday gathering I remember being. Yeah. There's still a few Sunday gatherings, like sporadically, um, but I agree. I mean, the Sundays are great because you can you could go out at six o'clock. Peak would be around nine or ten. Mm -hmm. You can be home, like if you're a nine to five or by eleven, twelve o'clock in bed. But there was something get about up in the, the morning. Yeah, but there was something about the energy of a Sunday. Happy. Yeah, just light and happy. And and it, it was everyone was more aware. I don't know it's because less uh, chemicals or whatever. That doesn't matter. But there was just something that came with a Sunday afternoon, <clears throat> early evening party that was just so amazing. And yeah, I, yeah. I agree. I miss that. Yeah, I miss that. So we've got a few questions for you, Susan, if you're up. Let's go. All right. Sure. So first question comes from uh, Gualtier Mald one of the DJs here on Twitch. Um, and Susan, you said a few months ago that this period was like our Holocaust. How do you feel now, optimistic or disappointed of the audience about the behavior during the pandemic? And how do you think you're gonna reinvent the future of the club scene? I said it was like a Holocaust. Uh, no, okay. Nice. What, what's the what's the first? Yeah. What's the first question? The first question said, yeah. is yeah. The first question is how do you feel uh, now? Optimistic or disappointed of the of of the audience? I, I'm assuming he means club goers that are going out during the pandemic. How do you feel about their behavior? You, you know, I, I can't speak to that because New York, nobody's going out. True. I mean, they might be going to private parties, but our clubs are not open. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I struggle with this because I don't want to judge anybody. Yeah. I, I, if I were 27 years old, I had asked myself, would I be going out? Mm -hmm. And I can't say honestly that I wouldn't be going out. Yep. I'm 27. If I get sick, so what? Mm -hmm. For the most part. Right. Where it gets a little tricky and where I have an issue is when you're not mindful over what you did when you're around people who have compromised immune systems or are elderly. Yeah. Or of, you know, anybody over... 50 60 mm -hmm. you need to be careful mm -hmm. so if you're gonna go out and party it's highly likely that you can catch something in a club um just be mindful who you're around afterwards for a couple of weeks yeah quarantine and such yeah quarantine and that's and your responsibility we all have a responsibility in this pandemic to be mindful of others. Here, here. Nobody's saying don't live your life. Absolutely. But and we all need to chip in and be mindful so we get through this, get through this quickly. Totally. And I've asked myself the same question. And I've said to myself, look, if I didn't have the type of home environment that I do, I, you know, my husband and my dogs and, you know, people around me who I am in quarantine with, if I was single, right? If I was by myself for, for nine months, I think I'd be at my breaking point by now. I mean, I'm already almost at my breaking point to where I'm just like, guys, I don't know how long I can do this more, much longer, you know, the mental state and just not seeing people. So, but if I was single, not having anybody around, I can totally understand why somebody would take that risk assessment and say, look, I'm young. I, I'm right. You know, just, you know, if you're going to work the next day and there's, some, exactly that, the grocery store <laughs> you, you, know? you know you just need to be a responsible individual so 
Yeah, it's a slippery slope. It is. Yeah, it is very much a slippery slope. I agree. Um, and I've been struggling with the thought and and you know from from even f with us like the fine line of us djs um is it right to play is it not right to play is it um we need to survive we 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 should we should take responsibility but surviving is one big thing right so um absolutely there's this thin line like what is right what is wrong and we are in the eye of everybody because it's uh, if someone goes to a party it stays um hidden mm -hmm. right. if we play somewhere it's advertised so it's right. you know and at the end of the day you know what is it's difficult it's it's such a difficult position that we are all in um here there is no parties in la and seattle there is nothing is open there is nothing but then yeah New York, um, Miami, there's yeah. a lot going on. Atlanta, there's a lot going on. So mm -hmm. um, whether it's right or not, it's legal. That's it's, legal. it's legal and that's beyond our power, you know? It um, it, it's, it's, more, it's, it's more like we, we got to make a living. And the choice is, is am I going to live off the, the, the government? Mm -hmm. Oh, I am going to not live off the government and do what I need to do, which is work mm -hmm. respectfully right. and take my precautions with it. Right. But, it's, it's, a um, it's a different calculation for everybody. I think everybody just needs yeah. to recognize that, you know? Yes. And um, not judge it because totally. we all right. need to do it from a diff. We all need to do it because of different reasons. Right. Right. I agree. But as Mentally long as we're all taking stable. precautions, I think that's the point. And that's yeah. it. And, and, and exactly, and that's it. And as long as the clubs do their, in this case, the clubs uh, do their um, Due diligence. duty that they need. Yeah. yeah, because in here, you know, being a sag after member, you go now on set and there is a COVID officer. That's a new job that appeared in the last year. There's a COVID officer who really makes sure that everyone is at their distance, has their masks on, has everything up to date. So that's why we can now have productions and TV and everything is rolling. As long as clubs can somehow do that, which is difficult. Mm -hmm. Sure, I understand. Right. Once, because once they're in the club, how many securities can walk around in a club, you know? But as long as the club does what it needs to do, I think it's fine. Yep. But so the second question, the second part of that question, Susan, is probably the more interesting one to me, at, at least to know your answer to. And that is, how do you feel like the uh, club s club scene or the, you know, the, the, the facilities at clubs are going to change due to COVID? We've all learned how to live stream now. I think everybody, every DJ on earth knows how to be a live streamer. Okay. So w how is that going to influence the way that clubs are run or the way that parties are designed and, and, and operated. Is it going to, do you feel? I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, I wish I can give you an interesting answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's ask you it this way. Would you, would you like it to change? Would you like to see as part of a party that they have a live streaming, a live stream of you and the D and the set and the crowd and stuff. It's more promotion, isn't it? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You mean when the clubs open? Yes. See a live stream of me and the crowd so people can watch it. Yeah. Uh, Maybe not the crowd because you know you know what kind of stuff goes on in the crowd sometimes, but you know. No, I know. I, 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 I of me with the crowd. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hands and all that. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, oh boy, um, I, I don't know if I'm the right person to ask that question. Mm -hmm. Look, I come from a school of. If if I were king, queen, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't even want cell phones on the dance floor, mm -hmm. and that's promotion too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, 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 I how much more are we going to promote? What happened to the underground? What happened to being mm. 
discreet to it, you know. Preach, preach, <laughs> preach. Can I can, can I can I put a, a 909 kick under your preach right now, and we'll just make it a track of it? What happened to the underground? I love that. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I I don't know if that's necessary. Why do we want to promote more? I I I know maybe mm -hmm. a promoter would say yes. I want everybody to see how fabulous my party is while it's going on. This way, they can jump in the car or hop in the subway or call Lyft and get there. Mm -hmm. I, 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 you know well it also is... takes away the um it takes away the exclusivity mm. of the dj the sound the club what's going on there if you go to berlin at berghain there is no cameras allowed never been there is no I, footage what's I going on in like there that. and i, I like, like that too and i think that's amazing yeah mm -hmm. i think that's amazing that people have to go to find out what it is will be not possible these days anymore because everybody has uh, phones and although like i said in berlin at berkheim you're not allowed to take your phone inside you have to put it on a coat check and people are really cool with it yeah why is the what's the reason for that though is it because some risque stuff goes on on the dance floor or is yes. it because they want everything they, is so it's not about the music well, so let's I, so no. let's be clear it's no. not about I, I the music i don't no. know about that josh i mean the thing is is the Saints started just doing the same thing when, you know, during the Black Party. They right. asked for your phone. Right, but and again, but that's because of the, the risque behavior. No, on it's the, not. It's not? No. Oh. No, no. I mean, that could be part of it. Yeah. But it's also about just living in the moment. Hmm. Just being with each other. I agree with if that. If you go in a club, everybody is so busy on their phone, trying to find their friends, taking pictures of each other. Trying to find their next but, hookup. <laughs> it's like, we find them on the floor. Other, <laughs> you know, without a phone. I'll see you at 2 o'clock at 8 o'clock in the morning. 2 o'clock being <laughs> from the DJ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, two, oh, right. You know, position wise. It, it, okay. It, it, it really kind of becomes nothing but a distraction. It's true. When you leave your phone, if you put your phone down, don't bring it to a club. Try it once and see how many people you have some kind of moment with. Hmm. With words, without words, give it a try. How much Absolutely. more you're connected with the DJ and the music. Yeah. I think I'm so, going to be sure. I think I'm going to be worried about whether people even want to get close to each other on on the dance floor anymore, let alone put their phone away. I mean, with, you know, because of covid and because of the things that have gone on like you know we're all being told to stay away from each other what is that going to do to the dynamic on the dance floor well has it changed the dynamic in atlanta or miami i mean i haven't been to any of these clubs i don't know but i have a really hard time thinking the boys are going to stay away from each other no they won't i mean i i saw i, I often on alan alan t um does a live stream from space where he works and um and there's all these parties and it's at it's not at capacity at all so they're very they it's half of the club is empty um but yeah people inside don't wear a mask which i'm shocked mm -hmm. that um i think that i i think you uh you need to have one to get inside but then when you're inside apparently you don't well that's like a t-shirt sure. That's like a raise my yeah. It just raises my eyebrows, but hey, I've each to its own, right? Um, but I do. Uh, but they are totally living parties like it used to be. They're all scattered at the bar and kisses and hugs, and so I don't think it's gonna. For those who decide to go, I don't think it's gonna change anything because those that decide to go already have are fine with the idea. I believe. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I mean, look, we're, we've, you know, vaccines are coming. Thank God. So yeah. by the time most of the clubs are open, the, the mass majority of the people mm -hmm. who go to clubs, I would think are going to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So some people might change their behavior. Some, some might not. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly hopeful, um, and I'm keeping an open mind and I'm, you know, things, things will get better. And I think everybody needs to just keep, keep positive. And, uh, yeah. So, um, Marco, I think, you know, do you have any more questions for Susan? Here? I, yeah, I have one question 
So what is next for Susan? Yes. What can we expect? What is what is Susan got in her little kitty bag? Well, I don't know. <laughs> You know, mm, I, mean, I don't know, Susan. Well, no, you, you just know, want to drop it. I, I, it's you know what I'm. I'm staying very busy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm working on music. Good. I'm doing some of the the uh, virtual things. Um, there's something else I'm working on. I don't want to say. Because, and you don't have to, because know. that keeps but, us. Because that will keep us being really paying thing. attention. You know, when you work on a lot of different things, or let's say two or three things, things could happen from that. Totally. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It can roll into <clears throat> other opportunities. So I'm just staying on top of things. So I am, I don't want to miss a beat <laughs> when things go back to normal. I want to be a couple beats ahead. Yeah, yeah. Like you've always been, right? Because that's well, why you around is because I'm very sure you've been always uh, ahead of time with things and knew well, and could see that's, trends. That's a fact. I know that you're humble about yourself, but that is um, that is a fact. You know, yeah. a lot of a lot of people don't make it 40 years, Susan, in this industry. People, yeah, a lot of people don't make it five years, let alone this long. So I would say. That it is definitely a testament to the fact that you have you can stay ahead of the curve. So yes. Well, thank you, thanks, guys. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> and, <laughs> yes. you know, like I said, I said that to, um, I said that to Deanne and 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 Susan Estera, that if it's hard for a male in the industry in the dj industry especially in the lgbtq for a woman it is such a different task and such a different challenge and i just respect female djs so much for for it because it's just a different hustle a hustle that i don't know and that i will right. never know but right. um but the fact that you know you've been here now for 40 years and go through so many sounds and clubs and ups and downs and lefts and rights and look at you you still here and doing the game strong and coming up with plans for the future it's just amazing you didn't give up and i'm sure there were moments actually that's a question the last question for me is were there moments where you wanted to hang up just well, Hang it on the hook and he, say, like, it, I can't do it no more. This is not for me. It's not going into the right direction. I, I to put it differently, hmm. I clearly remember moments because I want to say something I clearly remember. I remember several times crying myself to sleep because I was so frustrated and upset. Hmm. I really had to deal with barriers and mountains that were difficult to get through certain individuals. And it's really not like what none of us have to, have to deal with. We all deal with that, I think, on some level. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. no, I never wanted to give up because I, I didn't. But I... I did my share of crying, cussing, yeah. <laughs> kicking tires. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, uh, Felicia, Fel, Fel, uh, DJ Felicia Villani in WeHo, just, uh, she posted a little while ago a comment that she said she played with you, I believe she said in Houston before. Yes. And yeah, and you played in, in Dallas. At, oh, sorry, Dallas? In, da in Dallas, my bad. Uh, but but uh, she said that you guys both had to chase the promoter for your money and your flights afterwards. Oh my God. <laughs> yes. Yes, we did. <laughs> so, I mean, it's stuff like that that I can imagine would be a, a breaking point for a lot of people. Like people would be like, I'm never wanting to do that again. Like, and this is it. Like, I'm done, you know? Yeah, I, mean, I never looked at that kind of stuff. That is a breaking point because it, that stuff didn't happen a lot. Somebody not paying you. Yeah. I think that's happened to me twice in 39 years, 39, 40 years. Mm -hmm. It was, for me, it was um, 
not feeling like I got the recognition mm. or the chance that I felt I worked for. I did, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, struggling with different people who, uh, like, you know, there were several promoters who wouldn't hire me because I was a woman and said so. What? Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going back yeah. to the early 90s, but right. that was said. You know, it's not an assumption on my part. That was, mm -hmm. you know, that was tough. That's what I'm talking about, where I, you know, that kind of stuff when that happened it wasn't like it happened all the time that's what i'm what i'm talking about when well I but say, it doesn't happen myself to sleep it yeah. doesn't need to happen all the time you know it, it needs to happen uh, twice the most for it to uh, mark and for it to uh to leave to, to leave a little wound in it you know and um that's what I always thought is like back in the days, it was probably a lot harder because it was pro probably not cool to be a female DJ. These days, I think there's a lot of right. there's a lot of coolness and a lot of people are appreciating a lot more female DJs and take them serious mm -hmm. um, than, right. you know, then and it's all and then it's also the, another thing is like a look thing, you know. Unfortunately, if you have a certain look and you look pretty or beautiful as a woman, male, whatever, it automatically means there's no talent. It's taken away from you. Like, right. That's no right. one is allowed. I don't know if I'd agree with that. I'd say it's the opposite. I agree with it. I Well, you said uh, it. I, 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 I agree with it, Josh. I, I think, well, look at the posters that you put on with the DJs with their shirts off. They're pretty. They're very pretty and they get opportunities sometimes that others who are not as fit or as pretty as them get. So I think it goes but both what ways. What I'm saying is we're talking about when you look at it, it's about the look. It's they're automatic to be like, yeah, but he's probably shit. Okay. So you're Deborah saying DeLuca, in terms of Deborah talent. DeLuca, right. Deborah DeLuca, who is a techno DJ. She's beautiful. I mean, supermodel look. Uh huh. It took her years. For people will all be like, she's not even playing. So live. you're saying like Paris Hilton, like Paris Hilton is a pretty good DJ now. She's gotten better, actually, if you've heard her recently. But she was never taken seriously because she was Paris Hilton and she's pretty, right? Is that what you're talking about? No. Okay. Then maybe. But I'm... I see. Some, I see that. I yeah. definitely see both. So you, you know. So I'm saying that's why I'm saying it goes both ways. It it yes. could be so. One hundred percent. So I think what we need to realize is that we need to stop considering looks. Period. It is about yeah. someone's raw talent and whether they can right. do it. So how do you prove right. that to someone as a DJ? How how have you proven to D, to promoters that you you are capable before you go on stage? How do you do that? Are you, are you asking me? I'm that asking. Or? I'm asking everyone. Yeah, you, well, the people in the comments. I, I did it before that was even a consideration. Okay. You know, uh, my first. Nobody even cared what a DJ looked like before. Well, also. Two thousand, maybe twenty. Because you know, Susan five. And Susan, correct me. That's because DJs were not on the flyer. It was the name. DJs, DJs weren't on the flyer, but also if I go back and think about the DJs back then, they weren't dashing men. Mm -hmm. Not that they weren't good looking, but right. it, you know, it what it just wasn't. You know, first yeah, of all, it was so much sense. harder to DJ back then. Yo, tell me about so it. So much harder. Mm-hmm. Because you had vinyl, you didn't have mm -hmm. a, a, a a sync button. Yep. You had to spend endless hours a week in a record store. It was expensive. It was mm -hmm. a lot of work, and you couldn't, after two years, play a party and not have a train wreck for <laughs> you know in a couple hours. That you couldn't correct by pressing the sync button really exactly. quick. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just a different animal then mm -hmm. well, you this... know now i think somebody who's <laughs> starting wild. off now has a whole other challenge than i did 
40 years ago. Yeah. As much as I feel like as much as it's easier to get the attention in the first minute uh, and also the actual art of DJing when it comes to beat matching, because that's not the art to me. That's not mm -hmm. the art. Um, but that hurdle they don't have anymore because of the sync buttons, because of, because of all that. But then to prevail throughout all of this and still make it i mean that comes down like someone just posted it it all comes down to the music yep. and how you and the choice of tracks but djing is not train wreck or not it's choice of tracks um set, yeah totally agree oh 100 percent. you guys are right however there's bias in our community all around us and it's and it sometimes is 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 bias that you don't realize is happening in your head, you you come with a preconceived notion of how somebody is or what they are or what they're capable of based on how they look, based on how they carry themselves, based on what they might even say. And promoters are guilty of this too. DJs are other DJs about other DJs, gay men about gay men, gay men about lesbians, lesbians about gay men. It happens all the time. Straight people about yes. us. So I guess what I'm saying is the 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 bias happens and we need to figure out a way to get rid of that bias ourselves me and me and myself how am i going to get rid of my biases so that i come out all of my future business endeavors as a dj with an open mind and i think everybody needs to ask themselves that question and That's i think a, a lot good of good question josh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that is amazing and that is also uh, just a beautiful little mic drop that you put at the end and i think <laughs> no it is amazing it's i mean uh, you know we all should leave with that question and with that task you yeah. know with the task to just uh it's a good question mm -hmm. yeah it is very i'm Let's very proud yourself. of you my co-host i'm very proud of you co-host Hugs. <laughs> Hugs. <laughs> Hugs. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, what can I say? This was exactly what I thought it would be. Um, I know, Susan, you were so nervous about this to sit down and because you didn't yeah. know where this conversation goes. And we <laughs> wanted to make sure that you know that this is a safe space uh full of positivity and, and we love and, you to death and we teaching, just like amazing. really and yeah. i i'll be there valentine's day i already yes. told my boyfriend i was like listen boo boo there is, <laughs> i was like whatever romantic shit you got planned Mobile will be in the background. <laughs> she'll be in the background it could be naughty it could be i don't know what it is but um will um <laughs> i'll definitely tune in and support you and i'm Same really here. really curious yes. Thanks, and um, for those who Thank don't you. know it's twitch.tv forward slash morabito nyc right susan yes. okay yes. morabito nyc go follow and subscribe if you can um yes and, yes. Yes. yes and we and are next week i have a guest dj joe espinosa who's absolutely wonderful i think i might mention that we did a white party together and the music's yes. going to be very uplifting that's awesome light. i can't wait and we it. all here for this so, we want to say thank you to everyone who tuned in today we've yes. got we have we still have a busy uh, a busy <laughs> house up in here yes. um the episodes will be on all the platforms to restream and you guys been nothing but amazing joshua you know what i think about you so thank you all right cool thank you guys so much through susan i will see you soon and Thank yeah. you. Thank you guys, guys for doing a good thing. Thank you so much. Thanks for Susan. having me. Yeah. Of course. You Thank you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Be safe, everyone.